with a pro wrestling star arrested on battery charges and more. This is Wrestling Hub, my name is John, and you're watching the Wrestling Report for May 31st. Before we get into the rest of the video, make sure you subscribe to Wrestling Hub and turn on all notifications to stay up to date with everything in the world of pro wrestling. Also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Wrestling Hub Official and also follow us on Twitter at Wrestling underscore Hub. With reports circulating that he could no show the recent double or nothing pay per view after not appearing at the AEW Fan Fest, MJF would make it in time for the opening bout at the event, losing to Wardlow in minutes. Now, Dave Meltzer has noted on Wrestling Observer Radio that a meeting is set to take place between MJF and AEW President Tony Khan tomorrow. MJF showed up for the match at the event just shortly before it took place and left almost immediately after. With Tony Khan declining to comment on the situation and the post-show media scrum, MJF will be taken off the road for the next couple weeks by the promotion, as his absence could even be extended. Previously, MJF has talked about the date in which his AEW contract will expire and has spoken about the possibility of joining WWE. With all this presumable tension, it remains to be seen how this meeting goes tomorrow. On the Gentleman Villain podcast, William Regal recalled a pitch from WWE Creative that would have changed his character, saying, I remember once when one of the creative people in WWE said to me, can you do an American accent? It was his idea and only his idea. He didn't last long there. His idea was to change the character of me to make me American. I was like, that doesn't make sense whatsoever. It was one of the few times that I actually said no to anything. Regal would also comment on talent complaining about creative. You can look at things in two different ways. You can either say, sit and whine and moan about it, or you can go, what can I take from this? I found that for whatever reason, that was my ability in this job that has made me last this long. Even if it was a bad experience, I used to think, what can I take from this? Not, oh, this is wrong. If you look at this and go, what can I take from this? Whether it's, I'm never going to do that, I'm never going to treat somebody like that, I know not to do that again, or I'm going to avoid doing this. You learn it. If you're like, oh, this is terrible, this is rotten, this is crap, I'm not going to do this, you're just shutting your brain off. If you have that open-mindedness to everything, you have no idea what you're going to retain, and it can be useful to you. The only thing that matters if you're a talent is number one is getting hired and keeping the people who are paying you happy. Whether they like you or not, as long as they're paying you, that's number one. Number two is connecting with an audience. I tell people, just make it work. If you're given anything as a talent and you say this is rotten, this is no good, I don't get it, there's a good chance it's going to be rotten. While WWE has seemingly relaxed its policy for talent using cannabis, former SmackDown general manager Teddy Long, during an interview with Wrestling Inc., recalled not smoking out of respect for the WWE chairman. I said, hey man, my job is more important, so I don't want to let Vince down. That man gave me the opportunity of a lifetime, and the reason I am where I am today is because of Vince. So I quit maybe about a year. I quit for a real long time. What made me start back, man? I think I just got kind of burnt out. I had been on the road for over 25 years years of my life. I think it just kind of got stressed, then me and Kyoto kind of started writing again. Long even mentioned what was said to talent during company meetings in this time about marijuana. It was going to kill our brain cells, and it was going to do this, and it was going to do that. But you know, I guess that's part of it. They got paid to do their job, and that's what they did. When it comes to what's next for the Dark Order faction in AEW, Evil Uno told NBC Sports that the tag team titles are their next goal. I think every pro wrestler should want and every pro wrestler should try to be champion. Every pro wrestler should aim for more than what they have currently. But I'm not the type who holds on to negativity, so I'm very happy where I'm at and I'm very happy with the Dark Order. I feel like we are very beloved and I feel like we are practically the heart and soul of this company. With group members more often appearing on non-televised programs 
terms like dark and elevation, Uno understands this was inevitable given the size of the AEW roster. When the Dark Order started, we were completely unknown. So at Double or Nothing, we showed up and we were met with Who Are You Chance, which completely at the time was justifiable. We had been in Canada for about eight years and nobody knew who either of us was because we had changed names, changed characters. But that kind of was the goal was to come in and be a mystery and develop that mystery over time. Now we're established characters, but we are so vastly different than what we were three years ago. I could have never predicted my course in AEW. There are so many things that have changed from the path of what I thought I was going to do. I'm happy in the position I am, definitely. If you're going to talk about the top 10 wrestlers of all time, we have way more of them than we did before. So I am not upset if I do not make this pay-per-view card. There are always other pay-per-view cards, but I would lie if I would tell you I don't want more. Ever since Sasha Banks and Naomi walked out on WWE during an episode of Monday Night Raw, the company has been looking at plans for what to do regarding the now vacant women's tag team titles. On Wrestling Observer Radio, Dave Meltzer revealed that it's not looking good for the rumored tournament to crown new champions. The women's tag team tournament is dead in the water. They had an idea for a four women's team matchup. It was pitched, but it was never signed off on as of like a week ago. Now I have no idea what's going on, not any word either. Talking to Inside the Ropes about his WWE career, Charlie Haas revealed whose idea it was to have him impersonate other stars. Saying it was the head of talent relations for the company, John Laurinaitis. They were trying to get me out of WWE. When they gave me the character gimmick, John Laurinaitis, Johnny Ace did that. I wasn't going to pout about it. Oh, this is BS. I did it to the best of my ability. I tried to honor these icons, which they were. If I signed it as the Glamour Haas or Haas Hogan or Stone Cold Steve Austin, those things are worth a lot. I mean, you're talking 50 to 70 bucks an autograph if I sign it that way. So I'm like, all right, so who's laughing at what? I think it was their way of trying to get me out, but it is what it is. It was previously announced by AEW that Matt and Jeff Hardy along with Jurassic Express and Christian Cage would face the Undisputed Elite. With Adam Cole and Jeff Hardy being pulled from the bout, Dave Meltzer gave a reason as to why Hardy could not compete. Jeff Hardy was a mess going into Double or Nothing. From what I was told, it was really the Darby Allen match. He was beat up. When he went to AEW, you can watch those highlight reels and see how he did some big stunts at his age. And he's paying for it now. Taking to Twitter following his loss of the AEW world title to CM Punk, Hangman Page wrote, I've had a while to reflect on my time as AEW champion now that it's come to an end. Thank you all, not for supporting me, but for supporting the vision. It's not about the gold or the glory. It's about the common love and dignity with which we treat each other. Change the world. In some unfortunate news, AEW star Lee Moriarty went on social media to reveal that his young nephew has been killed as he wrote, My nephew was one years old and his life was taken in a drive-by yesterday. I don't share things from my personal life often, but he deserves to be acknowledged for the great person he was growing to become. Miss you. I'm muting this, and I'd prefer no messages. Thank you. Of course, we wish Moriarty and his family all the best during this time. With former WWE star Jake Atlas recovering from a torn ACL he sustained during his debut match for AEW, he was arrested on May 23rd on battery charges, with him assaulting his partner of several years. PW Insider said the report claims that Atlas was out drinking at Bid Daddy's Roadhouse the night before, May 22nd, and called his partner at 10 p.m. EST to come pick him up. When his partner arrived and attempted to bring Atlas home, Atlas instead wanted his partner to remain and drink with him. The victim stated that Atlas later wanted him to go back to another friend's house to be intimate together but Atlas, according to the victim, was upset his partner was showing half more attention to her than Atlas, sparking a verbal argument. Atlas again attempted to attack the victim, with the witness again trying to stop it from happening, but this time the altercation left the victim with a scratch on his left forearm and his tank top torn. Dave Meltzer would report that Atlas was never on the AEW roster page, as some fans mistakenly thought he had been removed. While he signed an appearance deal for the company, it was never a full-time contract.
Going back to the topic of MJF's AEW status, Wade Keller of PWTorchVIP.com would discuss what's happened over the past few months. For the better part of two months, there has been tension between MJF and Tony Khan, and initially appeared to be spoken by MJF not going through AEW's PR department to schedule an interview that he did with Ariel Hawani in early April. Now, back at that time, I was told that the interview would have been approved had MJF gone through proper channels, and he didn't, and he was reprimanded for it because it was bypassing standard protocol. A key source in AEW, though, indicates Tony Khan wasn't all that upset about the situation. It was just something he felt he needed to bring up to MJF like, hey, don't do that next time. Now, other sources indicate that the conversation didn't go well, because from there, it veered into MJF expressing his bitterness over his contract status, and that it was a breaking point in their relationship. MJF has since made it clear that he's unhappy that he wasn't given an early contract renegotiation offer. His current deal expires in just over 18 months at the very start of 2024, January 1st, in fact. MJF MJF signed an original starter contract with AEW that was in the range of probably dozens of other early signees who've been with AEW ever since. Some have been cut, some have stayed in the lower cards, some have moved to the mid card, a couple maybe moved to the upper card. Nobody's moved higher than MJF among those on those starter deals. And by a starter deal, a very broad loose range is like $40,000 to $70,000. Like you can make a living, but you know, it's a starter deal. And some might not even be making $40,000. And I know there's some people who are just on a per day basis, but this was among the people who started signing starter contracts, people without a lot of leverage and any national TV exposure. And Tony was at a point where he's handing out a bunch of contracts and wanted to see who would be good and who wouldn't be, you know, who we wanted to stick with and who we wouldn't. And so a lot of money goes out to a lot of people when you get that starter contract. And the idea for Tony is, you know, when they come to the ones who deserve it, we'll get a raise. By the way, MJF was given a raise once he signed with AEW, so he's making substantially more than the starter contract, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it is modest compared to the contracts of more than a half a dozen free agent signings AEW's made over the past year. Christian, Mark Henry, Malachi Black, Adam Cole, Brian Danielson, CM Punk. There's six right there, and I know I'm leaving off a few more. All of them are making more than MJF right now, like I'm told that with confidence. So yes, he got a substantial raise percentage-wise, but it's modest compared to the contracts of more than half a dozen free agents just in the last year that AEW paid, including wrestlers nowhere near his status as a top tier main event star and ratings draw. I think everybody would agree Brian Danielson and CM Punk deserve more than MJF. You would argue Adam Cole should probably be in the ballpark. And if he's paid more, it's not like a huge deal, but MJF has been way more valuable to AEW than Adam Cole. If you look at Christian, Malachi Black, Mark Henry, I mean, he's obviously worth more and has been worth more to the company. And he's just not getting paid near what they're getting paid in most cases, actually many cases. In many cases, those wrestlers are getting paid four or five times more than him. So, you know, MJF is by all accounts is kind of fuming over this. He felt that his work, his professionalism, his rapport and friendship with Tony Khan would have led to Tony renegotiating his deal when there was about two years left. And by the time January 1st, 2022 came around, yes, he got a new contract and a raise. But MJF was thinking, hey, come on, Tony, approach me. Get me on the level of some of these people that you keep bringing in. I'm doing great work and I'm drawing great ratings. And when Tony didn't do that, MJF, the way he handled it was to get very angry privately and then it kind of exploded. And I think Tony was caught off guard by how angry MJF was getting. And this was your Pro Wrestling News Update. I hope you're all having a great day. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you later.